Hey Wisecrack, Jared here. If your bunker has reliable Wi-Fi, you may have noticed a certain word making the rounds lately. In a growing coronavirus crisis. The coronavirus crisis. To the COVID-19 crisis. Coronavirus crisis. The coronavirus crisis. The corona crisis. COVID-19 is a crisis. But what exactly is a crisis? The meaning of the word seems obvious enough, but as we're about to find out, there's actually a lot more to it than you might think. Philosophers from Lao Tzu to Voltaire have been grappling with the idea of crisis for millennia. And now we're going to throw our mask in the ring. I mean, not literally, I've lost my spare. Welcome to this Wisecrack edition on the philosophy of crisis. In everyday speech, crisis is sometimes lumped in with words like disaster, catastrophe, etc. That is, words that call to mind some big, terrible event that causes a lot of damage. But the technical definition of the term is much more specific. The English word crisis has its root in the Greek word krinean, which means to separate or choose. Ancient Greek physicians used the term to refer to a precise moment in the development of an illness when a doctor must apply a particular treatment. According to the Hippocratic medical tradition, failing to act decisively during this brief window of opportunity could lead to the death of the patient. For Aristotle, the root krinean referred to a decision made in the political sphere, that is, a choice between contradictory options with the potential to create lasting changes in society. A crisis is a decisive moment in which there is the possibility for great harm and great change, and after which things can no longer be the same. One historical crisis in particular demonstrates how a devastating event can become the catalyst for government overhaul, redistribution of power among institutions, and even changes in religious thought. I'm talking, of course, about the Lisbon earthquake of 1755. Okay, so unless you're a history buff, you may not have heard of that one. But this natural disaster and the way that individuals and institutions responded to it contributed to major changes in the way that Europeans related to their governments and had a big influence on some of the key thinkers behind the scientific revolution. On November 1st of that year, while many were in church celebrating All Saints Day, a massive earthquake struck the capital of Portugal. The seismic activity leveled many of the city's buildings, crushing the people inside, and as icing on the sh cake, triggered a big ol' tsunami that added to the destruction. In the chaos that followed, a massive fire broke out and burned away much of what remained. It killed 60,000 people according to some estimates. The disaster sparked a crisis of authority, specifically the authority of the church versus the authority of the state. While the Marquis of Pombal, de facto ruler of Portugal, wanted Lisbonites to focus on distributing food efficiently and rebuilding the city, prominent Jesuit priest Gabriel Malagrida urged people to spend their time repenting for the sins that he felt had brought God's judgment upon the city. Thankfully, that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. U.S. Senator called me and asked me if Hurricane Katrina was judgment from God. I said, yes. <laughs> The crisis forced a choice between the authority of the church and that of the state, specifically a new absolutist form of authority which would place ultimate decision-making power in the hands of a sovereign at the center of a more secular government. By ignoring the church's plan for disaster response, Pombal's actions would represent a huge departure from centuries of church involvement in state affairs, as seen in the coronation of Charlemagne by Pope Leo III all the way back in 800 CE. In the end, Pombal made the choice for Lisbon, by having Malagrida publicly humiliated, strangled to death, and his body burnt at the stake. Like all crises, Lisbon was at a critical juncture in the Greek sense. Was the city to respond to the disaster with thoughts and prayers, or, you know, by digging survivors out from the rubble? But it also became a critical juncture in philosophy. In the wider European world, the catastrophe also led to a crisis of faith and philosophy that helped spawn completely new ways of thinking about the world and its relation to the divine. Before tectonic plates decided to treat Lisbon like an etch-a-sketch, early Enlightenment intellectuals spent a lot of time exploring theodicy. Theodicy is a branch of philosophy focused on reconciling the problem of evil with the existence of a loving, omnipotent God. Philosophers like Gottfried Leibniz argued that we live in the best of all possible worlds, a universe in which evils like natural disaster and war ultimately serve an inherent good divine purpose which is beyond our mortal understanding. For at least a few decades, this very nice idea was reasonably persuasive to his fellow thinkers until Lisbon. In coming to grips with the disaster, French philosopher Voltaire, zoomer to Leibniz's boomer, came to believe that the idea of an inherently good world was horseshit. 
Against contemporary deist philosophers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who defended the notion of an essentially good universe ruled by some benevolent force, Voltaire argued that our cosmos is fundamentally amoral, neither good nor bad. In the wake of the Lisbon earthquake, Voltaire wrote and published Candide, an entire effing novella whose primary purpose is to roast Leibniz and his metaphysical optimism. The story follows Candide, a young man who learns Leibnizian philosophy from one Professor Pangloss. Voltaire portrays Pangloss as a buffoon whose dedication to optimism leads him to absurd divine justifications for minor trivia and major evils alike. Voltaire has this Leibniz stand-in say, for instance, that we all have noses because God was thoughtful enough to give us a place for our spectacles, and that it's ultimately alright that Columbus brought syphilis back from the New World because, hey, at least Europe got chocolate out of it, and you thought your tweets were petty. The crisis of Lisbon pushed European thought to its limits, exposing the cracks in not only church authority, but also the realm of philosophy. In the decades following the crisis, the philosophical community opted for a more secular paradigm, leaving questions about God to theology and contributing to the removal of theological questions from philosophy. At the same time, responsibility for understanding disasters shifted over to the emerging field of science. Intellectuals let off trying to figure out why bad things occur and started investigating how they happen. Of course, other crises performed similar roles. In the aftermath of the Holocaust, philosophers were racked with basic questions of how did so-called civilization birth this monstrosity? Even the rise of fascism has been attributed to a series of crises which, at critical junctures, went the wrong way. The arguments of thinkers like Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci suggest that the conflicts exposed by long-term social change enabled totalitarian movements to seek out even more repressive means of control. And for Karl Marx, the whole theory that the world will move to communism is predicated on the idea that capitalism generates economic crises, and people will respond to those crises by mass revolt. Now whether it's an earthquake, an economic collapse, or a destructive political movement, the point is, a crisis tugs at the very structure of our world. It exposes the cracks and weaknesses. Economic crises can point to shortcomings in economic infrastructure. Natural disasters bring to light rampant inequality ranging from unsafe housing to food insecurity. Like the torch-happy Pombal, we are also facing a crisis which will force some pretty big decisions over the next few years. COVID-19 and our response to it will be sure to highlight a score of problems embedded in society. Take for instance how different countries responded to the pandemic, which revealed the very strength or weakness of that different system of government. While some have noted that China's authoritarian government was able to successfully stem the spread of the virus, the flip side is that the same government's lack of transparency allowed the infection to spread in secrecy in its early stages. On the other hand, democracies have greater transparency as well as a free press that's able to share information and criticize or support official policy, but those same democracies may be hesitant to enforce lockdown with heavy-handed policing and stricter rules. But pushing the limits of the democratic process isn't the only problem this crisis is exposing. It's also exposing issues in an area that may seem totally unrelated, industrial meat production. On the human front, the fast-paced production lines of the meat industry has workers laboring closer to each other than ever, and so it's no surprise that Tyson reported nearly 900 cases of COVID at one plant alone. But to zoom out a little, COVID exposes just how vulnerable we are to diseases that find a welcome breeding ground in factory farms. Evolutionary biologist Rob Wallace has pointed out that modern animal feedlots, which pack thousands of animals together in close quarters, are the little bear's bed to the flu virus's Goldilocks, a cozy biological stew in which to fester and mutate. Both the 2009 H1N1 virus and the 1918 Spanish flu, yeah, that flu, have been traced back to American feedlots. Now, we're not trying to take away anyone's hamburgers, and if anyone tries to take ours, we've collectively sworn to cut a Still, with the U.S. meat supply dwindling as factory farms and processing plants fall to COVID outbreaks, it might be worth exploring whether we absolutely have to get our steak and pork chops by cramming thousands of animals together in monotonous, unsanitary conditions for the duration of their short lives, or whether there might be a better way. Another weakness that COVID and similar diseases expose is how structural inequalities of all kinds can help create pockets of highly vulnerable people within the broader population of a city, nation, etc. With diminished access to testing and treatment, these groups endure disproportionate pain and death and can become the unwilling vectors for the spread of disease to other parts of the population. The virus has thrown these effects into sharp relief, and in the process brought up questions about how we ought to structure our economies, governments, and societies, and who ought to control them, and how. Everybody has something to say about everyone else's response to the pandemic. 
Whether they're shaking a fist at Florida beachgoers or seriously considering the upside of centralized despotism, people everywhere are thinking hard about where power belongs. Even in the US, federal interventions that would have sounded crazy just a few months ago are already up and running. $2 trillion stimulus package, anyone? Check, please. While no one knows for sure what our world will look like on the other side of this particular crisis, one thing is certain. Things will never be quite the same. But what do you think, Wisecrack? What are some of the biggest decisions we face as a result of the COVID-19 crisis? What might change over the next few years? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Big thanks to all our patrons, and be sure to subscribe and ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.